In a similar way to evaluating polynomials using corners here, where basically you have coefficient times the monomial term plus the next coefficient that sum multiplied to the monomial term, and so on and so forth. So you have a linear number of, well, you have something on the order, and n minus 1, n minus 1, some number of multiplication plus uh, n minus a uh, constant number of addition. So that's supposed to be the most efficient, efficient way to do it. Ideally, this is supposed to give you the same result as the Fermi interpolation, since that's also the given that you have for Fermi interpolation, except that you don't need to evaluate the pyramid algorithm every time. Here, you do this computation once. So that takes quadratic time calculation. And then once you have the coefficients, you just evaluate this linearly for each value you that you want to evaluate. Compare that to uh, both Taylor, both Fermi and Lagrange interpolates using levels and the standard levels algorithm given with the pyramid algorithm. That would have to be a testing quadratic time for each value of t, because every time the edges change the value for the value. Here, the pyramid algorithm that we generate does not involve t. Of course, this also, uh, this also is different from the other pyramid algorithms, where the pyramid algorithm gives you effectively uh, Mostly affine combination. For Lagrange, it's, uh, for Nevels, it's only affine combinations. For extended Nevels, where you have derivatives, you have mostly affine uh, combinations with some point vector combination, where you have Taylor series portions of your combination. So in that case, um, this particular algorithm, the divided difference algorithm that's used for, Neville, for Newton, <coughs> always <coughs> generates um, linear combinations. So for each pair of edges that you have, on the data, not a combination of the data. They don't have a connector. <coughs> so 
So in each of these pairs were the coefficients, uh, the nodes indicated are different. You always have the combination where you have one over the difference of two nodes on the right and negative one over the same difference on the left. That comes from this computation. This is the value from the bottom left. This is the value from the bottom right. That combination is the one on the top. So that's our recap as indicated here. So I'm going to follow the book a little more strictly because this portion of the book does something slightly different from the earlier parts in that uh, a lot of what's covered in the later part does cover some of the proof, but it exposes quite a bit more of the intention of the book later on when we talk about more properties. And then you'll see how that is presented here. Okay, so let that be an arbitrary curve. Use that progressive load basis. PSF n plus one load is not necessarily distinct. Denote mu k. So the book doesn't use d the way that I use d in our notation. It uses mu. Mu is d plus one. So it includes all of the derivatives plus the position. So whenever you see mu like in homework, whenever you see mu, it's actually supposed to represent d plus one. So the number of derivatives plus the position. The note mu k, the mu, the multiplicity of pk in the sequence, let this be the unique n degree polynomial of the Schuchat wave in k1. So this is the same polynomial that you get from Fermi's calculation. The definition here is that this divided difference is supposed to be the coefficient of e n. So this is the leading coefficient in that polynomial, in the polynomial representation of the interval. So that's supposed to be what's represented by all of these uh, divided differences. That's supposed to represent the coefficient of the leading curve. So that's consistent with what we already know, like from these definitions. So in the constant, obviously that constant that is not the Taylor For Taylor series, for Taylor series. So what we have for the Taylor series is um, small.
that includes positions and all the derivatives. Mm -hmm. Then we can get this by Fermi's interpolation. So that's the same as T of Fermi, where if you remember what we did with Fermi interpolation, this would be T e one of about N T, where Ti is the point Ti. E this is the uh, reminder that is extended. Expansion in Nellos, uh, in extended Nellos outer set. And then this one, E I J K L, E T L minus T, T L minus T I, T I J K plus T minus T I, T L minus T I. So this was what we used to determine this Fermi interpolation. So since the result that we get from Newton's is supposed to be the same as the result that we get from Fermi, the result that we get from Newton's should be the same formula that we have here. So in that, if that's the case, then each of these also interpolating their corresponding points should have uh, a Newton evaluation in a similar way. So, for example, uh, what needs to be shown is the leading term of f of t has coefficient of t of t what we want to show. This is what here 4.1 says. The leading term of this interpolant has this coefficient. So how do we get that? So we assume that we have uh, all that we need to show is that for each of these cases, the corresponding coefficients should be the ones that are given there. So here, it's constant, then the coefficient is Ti and of Ti. That matters. Since all this function purports to interpolate is the position at Ti, at Ti. So the leading term is the, the constant, yeah, basically what I said there earlier. So leading Again, this is the highest. Uh, this is the highest degree term that's included in this entire thing. This has degree k minus one. This has degree k. So the leading coefficient of the leading uh, the coefficient of the leading term has to be this. Okay, so that is f e i k plus one times. So all that we need to show is that that also follows here. So note that if this is correctly interpolated, so by induction, these are both correctly interpolated. The leading, oops, so the leading coefficient for the left term should be f e i t e j t e k. The leading coefficient here should be F E J E K E F. 
if this holds for these two, this is the great induction. So the leading coefficient for this has to be, because so this is a constant times that, the so constant times this term will give you the coefficient of the uh, part of the coefficient for the next term. This will give you so minus a term. This times the coefficient here will give you the contribution of this term to the leading coefficient of this. This times the leading coefficient of this gives you the contribution of this term to the leading coefficient of this. So in that case, the leading coefficient is yeah, negative 1 over T L uh, T L minus T I times F leading coefficient is that one T I T J T K plus for this term the coefficient is 1 over T L minus T I F so the leading coefficient of this particular polynomial is going to be negative 1 over TL minus TI times the coefficient of the leading term here plus 1 over TL minus TI times the leading coefficient here. That is by definition from here that's this so that means that the leading coefficient is going to be F E I E J E K which is precisely the coefficient that this theorem says we should that means that for every step of the extended level algorithm, this is consistent. So when we get the final function, f of t, it should follow that the leading coefficient for this final interpolant should be this final divided difference. So that's part of what we need to show, because it doesn't say immediately that uh, it automatically follows that the formula that we're using for the interpolant is correct. It just shows that the coefficient is correct. So that full proof is actually given here in the corollary. So given the arbitrary term, Progressive in basis, you know, the explicitly function that interpolates the given basis is given by the formula that we have here. That is the even coefficient of the polynomial interpolant are divided. So the difference here is that now we're including this part. That particular analysis doesn't look at the Newton group, just looks at the leading so, given that information, we can try to figure out what's going on here. So this is also by the number. The result follows by the number. If n is equal to zero, then you have the constant, and that is precisely f of t zero, which is the Newton divided difference result. So if it's valid for the first n minus one, well. In this case, this minus one bits of information. So you assume that. Let's put a half on that. For this one, n plus d i minus one i from one to f t one t i n t t one i. If this is true. For every bit of information except the last, this is going to be equal to f of t plus, so this f hat 
we test all the inferences that we get for the latitude of the vehicle, plus the final coefficient times the final Newton basis for log. So all that we know about this is this correctly interpolates. All but the last data point. So whether or not that data point is a location or the highest derivative of the last node. So it has all that information except the last. So we have to try to figure out if this function satisfies what we need, which is it interpolates all of the data. So what we know about this function? This function has t minus t1 to the d i plus 1, t minus t2 to the d uh, one, d1 plus 1, d2 plus t, uh, plus 1, dot dot dot, t minus t n. That's all of the derivatives required. Sorry, our it, it counts each of the nodes exactly di times. Now di plus one. So if di is zero, there's one each time. If di is one, there's two instances. One for the point, one for the derivative. So it matches all of that, except that for the last one, it only goes up to di. Well, okay. So it's possible that uh, the last two nodes are not the same. So this assumes that they're the same. If they're not the same, then this might be e n minus one, d n minus one plus one, d e minus d n minus one d e i. That's probably the safest thing. Single to right? All the way down, yeah. If you look at it properly, so f of t is equal to n plus sum of the i times the one. F t one t i n t one. So what we'll do is we'll extract the last third because all of the information is already interpolated by the second to the last interval. So we remove the last third minus one i minus one uh, i plus one f e one e i f e i uh, e one e i. So this is what I'm going to denote as F hat plus the final coefficient times the final Newton basis all in all. So, as we saw there, that final basis all in all now will include So this will be equal to p minus p1 to the d1 plus 1. All of the corresponding terms for each data point in p1. p minus p2, d2 plus 1. p minus dn minus 1, dn minus 1 plus 1. p minus dn. So notice here there's no plus one. There is one uh, one power that's one. You always don't include the last term. So in this case, if the last two are the same, uh, then that's going to be a non-zero number. If the last two are different, this term disappears. And you basically get all of the powers for the nodes prior. So that's equal to this term. 
So what we know about this one is that it should satisfy the interpolation conditions that we have. E i from E i for n. So not including n necessarily. It includes n if D i is greater than zero. the last point if you have more than just point information for the last one. And then you have all the derivative information as well. D i D take i i from one <coughs> i from one to n Or maybe this one. If the end So either this bit of information or that bit of information is the new bit of information. So we need to show that it satisfies the same uh, properties. It's actually not possible to show this part. Everything before the end. This is actually not part of the show because of this function. So notice that this function, n t t1 of the tn, the one that we write out here, if this is equal to t j, and j is from 1 to n minus 1, this is equal to 0. Because one of these terms is going to be equal to 0. If j is less than n, one of these nodes, if t is equal to one of these nodes, one of these terms becomes zero. Not only that, take derivative t j e one is also equal to zero if j is between one and not including n. And the derivative is the one that is described as dj. Because if you get any of the derivatives of this, well, any derivative of this up to dj, either you're getting the derivative of this term, j times, in which you have one term left, e minus dj or you have higher powers because you're getting derivatives elsewhere. In that case, all of the derivatives will contain at least one term t minus dj, and that means that it will be equal to zero. So that means that this does not contribute only for these always going to be evaluated for zero. At, uh, it will be evaluated to zero for every ti not including n. 
So these are automatically satisfied just from that definition. So the question then becomes what happens at the end? So there are two cases to consider if dn is equal to zero and then dn is greater than three. <coughs> so if dn is equal to zero, that means that this doesn't have a t minus t n term. This doesn't have a t minus t n term. So what you have is the value of f hat at t n. F at t n is going to be f hat at t n plus the f t n. So what do you have here? What's this value compared to this value? So this is non-zero. This is going to be Tn minus T1 to the D1, uh, D1 plus 1. Tn minus T2 to the D2 plus 1. Dot, dot, dot. Tn minus Tn minus 1 to the D n minus 1 plus 1. That's this. That's a lot of terms. Times this plus this. So what's this? So now see how this is uh, properly done. It's going to be something a little more. Apparently, the group that's simpler is instead of doing this evaluation, use the fact that the Newton basis is part of the, the Newton polynomial is part of the basis. And you make use of the fact that the only way that you can get a polynomial with a correct median coefficient is if this is multiplied by this, because this is a monomial. This is a monomial, a monopolynomial. So the leading coefficient of this function is 1. For this to be the correct interpolant, we saw earlier that the leading coefficient has to be this. So the resulting function this is a polynomial of degree n plus d i minus two. This is n plus sum of d i minus one. And if this is the correct polynomial, it has to have that is your leading coefficient. This polynomial has leading coefficient one, so the only uh, the only coefficient that you can add to it, sorry, that you can multiply it to, to get the correct leading coefficient is that number. It feels a little unconvincing to me actually, even if the I'm tempted to just do it that way, except that all of the complications get a little longer to try to work things.
companies to use a stronger argument for the web sharing. Even the book just tries not to do it. Do you the idea that it's that the mutant model of us make a basis? Sort of the test of grade A, see if the competition is in the nominal basis in the form of the circle that's so practically important. Yeah, it really feels very consistent. I think that's very good. We'll leave that for later and then see if we have time to carry out that. So, in any case, it uses the argument that if it matches the polynomial that you're supposed to get, they should have the same leading coefficient. And the only way to get the same leading coefficient is to multiply the basis polynomial n here by this constant. It's given here. Still doesn't feel very good. Anyways, so that's the proof that's provided by the book. So what I want to show is what the book says about these constants, these coefficients. Because the next section is all about the properties of these coefficients. So if you have two functions f and g, the coefficients of the sum f plus g are the sum of the coefficients coefficients for f and the coefficients for g. If you have a constant, you multiply it. So basically it says that this operation is linear. that vanishes on all but one of a fixed set of basis functions uh, and yields the value one of a single basis function is called the dual function. So this is something that we've seen frequently. It's what defines the Lagrange polynomials. We've used this to define uh, Fermi basis polynomials as well. And it can be used to define, uh, you can find a dual functional for the divided difference. For example, uh, for precisely, similarly, the divided difference is the linear operator that provides the dual functional for the Newton basis. So the idea is that if the function you want to interpolate is a basis function, because this is the notation that uses for basis function, then it follows that since that function of the uh, k minus 1, uh, the term that we're using there. From the uniqueness of the polynomial and interpolation, you say there's one polynomial that has the same yields, the same words, and it's this polynomial. So the interpolation should be the same. So there are two So if you use that, the polynomial interpolate is there. So when you evaluate the function, the basis function, and you get the divided difference, you get the divided difference of this function, then it's equal to zero to the zero to the h and one to the grade to the So let's see that in action. So you have n is zero. That's n is e one. That's some sort of constant. Uh, that's one, by the way. So n one and e one is e minus e one. N e and e one one Just to demonstrate what it's trying to explain there. So it uses this slightly different notation because it's kind of hard to explain how to get divided differences on this. So if you get the divided differences for this one, this is a constant function. I'm not quite clear what you can mean. Uh, I guess for this function, the only data that you have is that E1 
the value equal to 1. So that's the only information that's incorporated there. So in that case, if we use divided differences, you have 1, P1, and that's it. The third one. The one that's at the top of the pyramid is 1. That's precisely what we have. Uh, This function, we don't have the information there. So it's correspondent to the idea that the values are zero. This is trying to say the corresponding functions when you apply divided differences, the table that you get looking at just the left hand side. For the first function, it's 1 followed by zeros. For the second function, it's 0, 1 followed by zeros. For this one, for a longer demonstration. At P1, that's equal to 0. At P2, that's equal to 0. At P3, that's P3 minus P1. P3 minus P2. And then P4 minus P1. P4 minus P2. Now, sub four points. It's a very dynamic physics property. So, by the differences, that's 0.
minus b is divided by this number. It's a little more complicated. So you have this as t4 minus t3 times t4 plus t3. So there's a common factor. That's cancelled by the denominator. So you're left with t4 plus t3 minus t1 minus t3. That's the first level in Newton's divided difference. Second level. This minus this divided by t3 minus t1. t3 minus t1 divided by t3 minus t1 minus t1. This minus this. So there's a t3 minus t1 here. That gets cancelled. You have t4 minus t2 divided by t4 minus t2. And then the next level is going to be here. If you look at the coefficients, 0, 0, 1, 0. So that is what this is demonstrating. So it says that performing divided differences on the basis functions gets you a dual function, which is equal to zero at a particular node and equal to one at the ah, it's zero, it's one at a particular node and zero everywhere else. That's what this is. There's a question in the homework for this on other functions. So this is something that you will see occasionally for these basis functions. In fact, if you're looking at a polynomial space, often there is a dual functionality that performs an action on polynomials that gives you these results. So dual functionals are convenient because if you know the dual functionals for a particular basis, we can compute the coefficients for an arbitrary element with respect to this basis. So as an example, using the Lagrange basis polynomials, the coefficient for the Lagrange basis is the evaluation of the function under the dual function. So this becomes 1 or 0 if we plug in either uh, a value of pi. If i is equal to a, this is equal to 1. If i is uh, not equal to a, then it's equal to 0. So the corresponding coefficient to this is the one that makes the function of uh, the one that makes this equal to 1. So this is equal to 1 when you plug in pi. You plug in pi here, that becomes same thing here. For the basis function mk, applying the divided difference from the first to k makes this equal to 1. For every term before that, equal to 0. For every term after that, equal to 0. So applying the divided difference from the first to the k element is what makes this equal to 1. So you do not have this function. That becomes the coefficient. 
So that sort of generalization of things that we'll see when it comes to these. We'll see a bit more of it later on when we work with other bases on and on. So there's one in particular that we're going to use for the next examination for various bases. And then we'll have a few when it comes to uh, these lines, which is for third examination. But that property holds throughout, as we'll see. So questions at this point? Again, usually this part of the discussion is a little more abstract. A lot of this is proving, a lot of these additional properties. And for this particular uh, for this particular chapter, there's actually a section all about properties. So we didn't have an equivalent section for the previous chapters because they were somewhat straightforward. Here there are a few properties worth noting. And as we'll see in the later chapter, there will be sections that incorporate properties of the basis and for the equations. I think mostly for the basis, as we'll see later. So all the homework questions are from this section. I'll just point that out. So four point three is the properties of divided differentials. So here there is a list of properties given here for point three. So this basically says perform Newton interpolations using divided differentials. So there is this property, the recursive divided differentials definition, which is something that we accept as a uh, given. That is how we define our coefficients. The next one is a little is related to something we mentioned before. So if you have the divided differentials, notice that this is in sequence. If you rearrange them, it doesn't change the equation. Basically, as long as you include all of them, you're going to end up with the same result. This is the same as rearranging the values of the bottom. The value on the top is still going to be the same. Or another way to interpret it is to use a different path inside the diagram because that changes the order. Actually, that's probably not sufficient because if you're following path, E3 can only, only be followed by E2 and E4. So that allows the sequence E3, E1, E4, E2. And that will be required to rearrange the values here. So that's a, a property of a value that you the same throughout. That mostly is something that we've demonstrated by showing that if you use a different path, you can generate the same interpolation, the same interpolating function. This is combining the divided differences and the symmetry part. So think of it this way. If you rearrange this where Ti is the rightmost term and Tj is the leftmost term, this would be the rearrangement. So you remove Ti. Okay, in this case, sorry, Ti is on the left, Tj is on the right. So you remove the leftmost term here. You remove the leftmost term, so Ti is removed. Here you remove the rightmost term, Tj. Whatever you remove here goes here. Whatever you remove here goes here. That's consistent with what we have here. Whatever is removed here is here. Whatever is removed here is here. Because it's symmetric, you can rearrange it so that you can sequence again the easier to be at the same thing. So that's a combination of the first two properties. Linearity is relatively easy to show. Uh, I'll go through the properties, and the proof is actually given afterwards, and they're all one line proofs, mostly referring to other properties. Cancellation. This is equal to this function times that. So, this part. Here says 
there's a function that you want to get divided in the test or Original function and transmitter. And then we get these divided here. That should be equal to this divided here. Again, I'll just show the properties for a moment. There is a There is a phenomenon that looks like this. So usually when you have some form of linearity, when you multiply elements, you have this form. This is a convolution form. Okay. I'll just mention this this point in time. Leibniz rule looks like a convolution form. And I will examine it any further than that. But that does tell me something about when you multiply two functions. Highest order coefficient, this is the thing that we put in 4.1. Highest order coefficient of the Newton interplan that follows the computer in the basis. And this is part of the proof of the corollary that's given there. Newton coefficients, this is basically the definition of the interplan given the Newton basis and the divided differences. Dual functional is what we demonstrated there. Then you have the equality function. Basically, two functions match on all of the data. Then their divided differences are the same. That actually just tells you that if you sample the same data, you only have the unique interval. They could be different functions. They don't need to be polynomials. But if their data matches, they have the same interval. That's basically what it is. And then the last one, value of low order polynomials. If you have a polynomial of degree n minus 1, then if you get this would be a polynomial of degree, sorry, this would be associated with the Newton basis with degree n. So that means that this would be too many divided differences. So uh, this is something that you'll see if, like here, the function that we have here, n2, is quadratic. So for every level above quadratic, so this is constant, linear, quadratic. For every level above quadratic, all of the coefficients would be zero. But you can't have a term that is of higher degree than quadratic. In the original, for this one, constant. So at the bottom level, all of the coefficients are 1. And then at every level of it, all of the coefficients are 0. Because again, those would be related to the Newton basis function of degree higher than the original polynomial. That's why you see that in all of the uh, Newton divided differences for each of the basis functions. Once you go beyond the degree of the actual polynomial, all of the coefficients become zero. So that's roughly what you're seeing here. If f t is a polynomial of this n, then f associated with the polynomial uh, with the Newton basis polynomial of this n is the coefficient of t and in the polynomial Thus, in this case, this is a constant independent. So, just to reiterate that, you assume that you start with a polynomial. It has to be very n. If you sample it at n plus 1 points, this is always going to be the same. And that's always going to be the leading coefficient of this polynomial. It doesn't matter which points you sample. It's not a question of what order you get. It's actually a question of what nodes you get. So if I got this from t0 to 0, t1 to 1, t2 to 2, all the way to tn to 10, and I get this computation, I would get the same computation if I if this is polynomial of degree 10. I would get the same computation if I started with negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, all the way to negative 10 minus 1. It doesn't matter which n minus one point. In fact, it doesn't actually matter whether or not I'm using the same nodes or not. It could be t0 is equal to 
five. T1 is equal to five. All of them are equal to five. And this would still value the same number. That's what it is. So these are all properties of the divided event. So it's useful here because we can get to see additional properties of the diagram. Like what I mentioned before, where if you choose a different path, you get a different interpolant. Sorry. If you choose a different path, you get different coefficients and a slightly different configuration of the interpolant, but it does satisfy the same property. So you can get different interpolant by looking at different paths in uh, different paths inside the divided different table. And it actually denies the idea that they have to be in order because you can rearrange them and it would still work out. Which is weird. So rearranging them and basically rearranging uh, the way they're listed at the bottom gives you the same result. You still get an interpolant that satisfies the, uh, the given conditions there. So that's all of the properties that I mentioned. So in the next chapter, we'll be exploring those properties quite more in depth. So this gives us a good starting point, mostly because it's not 100% necessary for you to understand all of these properties. Because this is an alternative to fermite interpolation. If it becomes useful, then it's useful, but more often than not, you can just get these properties from actually just generating the divided difference table. It just happens that it predicts some of the behavior in the policy. So, Here's a list of proofs. They're all one line proofs. You're already familiar with these properties. We shall take property 7 as the definition of divided difference. So, this is the definition of divided difference. And we showed that it gives us the first property. So, it follows from, the first follows from 7. By here for my one. Number two, symmetry also follows immediately from seven because the interpolant is independent of the order of the numbers. So from what we know from uh, Lagrange and Fermite interpolation, the order of the numbers doesn't matter. As I said, three follows from one and two. Four follows by induction from property one. So the linearity property follows from property one from order of order and equal from seven by the linearity of polynomial. So interpolation is a linear operation. Follows from property seven, so this is Catalina's property seven plus this, this polynomial is the polynomial interpolation. E, this is the polynomial interpolation. Does not sound like this. Uh, six is the result of the analog of the Leibniz rule for the nth derivative of the product interval. So there is a rule in practice called the Leibniz rule that holds for the derivatives of the product. So there is a proof set for that. Seven is the definition. Eight follows from that proof. Nine is what was shown. Ten is what we demonstrated. Follows easily from property nine with equal to ng. And eleven, the one condition results from induction from property one and directly from property seven by the agent. And then Slightly longer conversation here about uh, if you're interpolating this one on the three. I think I'll do five. Just try to stretch our muscles a bit longer. Again, I can't see that. So let's do five.
So this is what we get from the divided different table when we start it out. Uh, supposed to interpolate this need to make sure that we're consistent with what we're given. Arbitrary curve. So F is not necessarily the model of a dust sum curve. So the suggestion is that if you interpolate, interpolate Whatever the properties that we get from F using this data generate this. If we apply it here, same thing, just multiply by P minus N pi minus E N plus 1. So basically, this now becomes the polynomial interpolation. That kind of makes sense. The rest of it is actually what we need to get. So if that this is the leading question. And what this says is that the leading coefficient of this is the interpolation over n of one point. That makes sense because if you have this polynomial, the leading coefficient of this would be one, one times p times the leading coefficient of this. So the leading coefficient should be the same as this one. So the way to get that leading coefficient, since this is a polynomial of degree one higher, is to add one more point. So just looking at the properties of this should follow, assuming that uh, the statement given in the book is correct. So if P interpolates F, P minus N plus one, times P interpolates P minus N plus 1 times F. It seems to make sense. So this is just to demonstrate what you will see in the book. Now, I'm pointing this out because this is something that we're going to see more frequently as we go forward. Since in the earlier part, we didn't have a section that talked about properties, we didn't have that much of a discussion about it. In this case, since the properties are given here, and in the later chapters we'll have equivalent sections, it's useful to look at what the book says. Not all of them will be useful. They're here just in case you need them for reference. There are actually some other properties that follow from symmetry, linearity calculation, and differentiation. Differentiation is a property that uh, that is associated with Taylor series. Okay, that. So 
So the divided difference is the unit operator satisfying four hours. So it says specifically this operation performing divided differences is unique in that it satisfies these four conditions. So not only does it have these properties, it's the only operator that has these properties. So what I'm trying to say is So a lot of that is further on, and a bit of it is beyond our scope. So Cushy's integration formula are related to complex analysis. Some of you may not be familiar with this notation. So those that are familiar with this have taken two That's a curved integral. The integral over a curve in two-dimensional space. The two-dimensional space here is a complex plane. That's why you have Z instead of X. So it's slightly beyond that. This may be useful for you if you try that, but I don't think you're going to be exposed to this in the I mentioned forward differencing because that's in the book, and some books will not use the divided differences. Luckily, it doesn't use divided differences, it uses forward differencing with this specific notation. So there is a pyramid algorithm here. It just says plus or minus because the coefficients are plus one and negative one. That's all that it equals to. It's a much simpler diagram. How useful is it is the question. What's the point of this in this particular thing? Is that it gives us if the nodes are evenly spaced, the forward differencing formula completes the normal divided differences form. That's all it basically says. Mostly because the differences here are at this level, one over delta, sorry, for the equivalent uh, divided differences, this would be one over delta B, negative one over delta B, the same for everything on this level. For the next level, it would be one over T delta B, negative one over T delta B, same for everything on this level. As you go up, every level that you go up, you increase the denominator. 1 over 2 delta t, 1 over 3 delta t, and so on. So it's useful in a very specific case. If these nodes are evenly spaced, that's all. If it is, then it, uh, it makes the computation faster because there's an algorithm called fast forward differencing that uses this line. And if that case arises, then in particular, this is true for the project because delta t is equal to one to the project. So if you're interested in this, you can look this up. May or may not be useful. So the last part here, as we'll see in some of the later chapters, is there is a summary and there is a listing of all the properties. Again, the same properties that we saw just previously, including some additional properties, affine combination, values of binomials, value on x minus t to the negative one, some additional properties, determinant formula, which I think is an exercise, Lagrange coefficient, again, it's an exercise, partial derivatives, I think we can some of these are actually for later work. Because it appears in chapter five. Sorry, this chapter four appears in chapter six. These lines are in chapter seven. So these are actually forward looking. And that ends interpolation. Even in the book. In the book, the next part is already approximate, which is what we cover in the next few examinations. Are there questions that you want answered now? Okay, so if there are no questions about that, I'm going to very briefly talk about the examination on Wednesday. So on Wednesday, the coverage of the examination is all the parts on interpolation. 
Lagrange interpolation on using level of algebra. Fermat interpolation on using extended level of algebra. And Newton's interpolation on using divided term. This is the formula sheet that we'll be using. So there's slightly different notation. Again, the first is no position number of data for that number. Mu i is z i plus 1. So it's the number of derivatives plus 1. So the minimum value of mu i is 1 instead of 0. It tells you if mu i is greater than 1, it tells you that there are derivative information. So this actually also lists it from 0 to n. And so for our general interpolation process, you have that. Given that, we now find the function that interpolates the points and interpolates the derivative. That's the general problem that we have for this particular section. This is extended methods. This is the Taylor series portion. So there's a slightly different notation there. It's just P I T. That should be P I I I I I T I. This should be P I I I I I T minus one. That's easy to do. Then the uh, base of the recursion. These are Lagrange interpolations. So these are multiple definitions. This is the one that's probably useful. This is an alternative form. Note that there is a weird thing about this particular function. It doesn't actually have a value at pi. So basically, it's equal to 1 in the limit. But some books will use this definition. You can always find a little weird thing about it. It's not value equal at pi. pi is the denominator 0. But it's something that I've seen in multiple books. And I think it's also in this book. So you might see that as an algorithm. Lagrange interpolation. Properties of the Lagrange interpolant. Divided different species. The Taylor series part for uh, equal divided differences. This is something to do with multiplicity of the load. So in this case, E0 appears mu 0 times, En appears mu n times. You can list it as S1 up to S mu, so that you're not sensitive to whether or not two consecutive elements are the same. Mu is the sum of mu times. This is equal to that. So this is another way of writing this. P is equal to this, so this is, Explain this is your Newton basis, and this is the whole internet out. Let's see if you don't have the corner side, or the corner side algorithm, but you can already be able to understand there. If you have grass manifolds, so instead of the point, you have grass manifolds, M-I-E-I-E. This is the corresponding position of if you're using Grassman. So use this bi here so that you can use li or fi or hi or whatever. Fermite interpolation. Definition of the properties of the fermite basis. So that is the formula sheet that you have there. That should indicate what you're going to need to do. As we said before, the exams usually have the same coverage as the projects, especially for courses that are algorithmic in nature, like this one. The you idea is to perform fees. the algorithm. The, the fee so format that you regret. that we have during the lecture is dollar. properties. <laughs> They're beyond. They're kind of the math part of the picture. So up to some extent, 
it's the computer science part of the course, how there's a part of the course, the project on, and we do the examination. That said, there may be some last right question, but we usually reserve the last right questions to those who are not sure. So there should be expected you'll see about four to more questions per class. Okay. 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 Maybe you'll see probably up to five points worth of math type questions. I won't give you too much detail on what the math type questions will be. Probably not as difficult as the homework question. It might be a little more in that area, but not too far from the actual algorithm part. So I will upload this to Muna and NSP so that you will be able to use this. Uh, and this point out the different test of notation because I'm too lazy to try to change this and this is more in line with what you can do You're allowed to get, uh, you're allowed to use calculators. But not the internet anymore. That's mostly so that you don't need to worry about the computation. There's a lot of computation happening. And usually for this algorithm by the person, I I won't say I encourage the use of calculators, but it's safer. <coughs> so if you want to use that, typical things, um, what else do I do? Not much. So that's, that's it for this. Any questions about this formula sheet? <coughs> for the actual breakdown of topics that you want to have, I'm in this space, I'll be Mm -hmm. I think it's the graduate preparation term by oh sorry, the graduate preparation levels of the term by interpretation. Enough to last the trimester. I don't think so. Uh data interpolation divided in That's the main conversation. You should be able to know how so everything to talks so far is will be will be tested. A lot of the questions will ask you to well you'll imply that you will need to perform the other. Whether or not it's will ask you to generate the polynomial or uh, evaluate the polynomial. Those are the ones that are what they are. Note that explicitly I have placed this part here. So, are there any questions? So there's a homework that we'll be doing today. As I said, all of the questions are going to be from section 4.2. The schedule for next week is on Wednesday, examination one. So if you feel like you need to bring a copy, uh, the homework will be done on that day as well. We will discuss the examination on the Friday that follows. Can you tell you not to put the homework on the same day as I said? At least you just do it at midnight, though. So, just because I finished the exam. So for week six, we start with the next set of topics, which is the Let approximation part. Let me have to confirm part. stuff. Go back here. So some people that have taken the three five one will probably start seeing the topic overlap with what we already discussed in three five one, because this is the part that I have to borrow. This class is what we Yes, we start with yes, the SBA from the class of triangle and the class of those algorithms. So usually have that quality. I've done. 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 I've done